Hello. Welcome to Redesign Wellness Podcast. That was my son, Benjamin, who gets rather excited when he can be recorded on audio and especially on camera. So my husband has started to vlog with them because they may be documenting some of our trip. Um, We have recently pulled Benjamin out of school and he is being homeschooled by my husband, which has been quite a challenge in so, so many ways. (laughs) And we knew we were going on this trip and so homeschooling would be in order and, um, let me just face it, my, my son right now is not gelling well with traditional school systems. So this has been a huge learning curve. I think I've talked about the struggles with my son uh, in past episodes, but we are on this journey of parenthood and it can really kick your ass sometimes. So I digress. But <laughs> they Benjamin loves to be on camera and he loves these kind of creative outlets. So I told them that if they're going to start a vlog when we're on our RV trip, I don't want to be on camera because, you know, I, w- I want to say when I'm on camera rather when I'm looking better than I do right now as I'm recording this audio. <laughs> I'm not sure I'll get much of a choice, but I just made my voice heard. But anyway... Redesigning Wellness Academy registration is officially closed for the year. So I stopped registration on January 31st, and I am thrilled with the first group of brave wellness professionals who took a chance on my new program and new training, and we are going through. And I plan to host Redesigning Wellness Academy again in February of 2021. So stay tuned. What I'm going to do is take this Six-month program I have, get so much feedback and make it better and um, more enticing for you to join next time. But on to today's guest, who's a repeat guest, Yers Muris. Now, I was sitting with Yers at a lunch during the Wellness Council of Wisconsin last September. We were both speaking. I knew him from interviewing him on the podcast. And it was him, myself, and many Spies, and we all ate lunch together. And we started talking about surveys. Because I mentioned it to, to him, hey, you need to come back on and talk surveys. And he's like, oh, well, I teach it in class. It's kind of a big topic to talk about on a podcast. And all of a sudden, Medi starts getting in on this conversation. She starts asking years a bunch of questions about the surveys she does. And then I was like going, you know, we all do surveys on the regular, right? I know I do. And I know I make some mistakes when I'm doing these surveys. So in the spirit of learning for all of us, I know I want to get better. And if you're a regular listener, then I know you want to get better with anything that you do. And surveys is just one of the things you do. And here is more about years. Yers Muris is an assistant professor of management and human resources and a faculty affiliate at the Institute for Research on Poverty and the Center for Financial Security at the Wisconsin School of Business. Wow, that is really long. And that's at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Yers looks at how work shapes people's personal finances and the resulting consequences for individuals, organizations, and society. Yers' work has been published in the Academy of Management Annals. Industrial and Labor Relations Review, Organizational Science, and Research and Organizational Behavior. He's also been in a ton of media outlets, including The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, et cetera. Years is also regularly invited to speak on financial wellness and other HR topics at professional events across the country. So what we talk about today, Years actually teaches as part of his people analytics class. And so I think he said it was 14 sessions and he tackles surveys in two of those sessions. And so what we talk about today is the mistakes we make when we're building our surveys. And he walks us through his seven steps, which I'll outline in the show notes because I swear, like when, when we were talking through it, I went all out of order, not his fault. It was totally mine. Um, so I'll make sure I put the seven steps in the show notes because, again, they're all over the place. Um, and then he talks about why having a clear goal or maybe a primary to secondary goal vital for success. We talk about those incentives. Should you incent, not incent? Um, Should it be anonymous? And he just left me with so many things to think about. Uh, So this is a great episode, jam-packed with things to consider when you're putting out an employee-wide survey. Now, before we dive into the interview, this episode is sponsored by Realize Wellbeing. Realize Wellbeing is a corporate wellness consulting and training powerhouse on a mission to help companies understand how they're impacting their own employees' well-being. 
They are dedicated to transforming workplaces into businesses that exude energy and innovation through their vibrant, thriving people. Maggie Golf gets a lot of requests to share her expertise with worksite wellness practitioners and those in human resources who want a fresh perspective on their work and increased capacity for organizational change. In 2020, Realize Wellbeing is offering a brand new Train the Trainer program, equipping you to bring their innovative strategy to your workplace. This four-week course will provide you with the specialized expertise to expand your efforts beyond health promotion in the workplace. At the end of this course, you will be able to develop new strategies for your company based in the science of self-determination theory and micro-influence. You will also receive four sessions of one-on-one coaching with Maggie throughout the rest of 2020, two trainings that you'll be able to deliver in-house, two fully developed campaigns, and a measurement tool. The April Train the Trainer session has limited availability, so go sign up today. You can go to realizewellbeing.com and learn all about this offer that Maggie is bringing to my listeners, and I will link it up in the show notes. And just a personal endorsement of Maggie. I just, she is a friend and and colleague, and I love the work she's doing, and she's always thinking differently and encouraging us all just to ask new questions, consider new avenues. I know she's done that for me over the course of the time I've known her. So go check it out. Go to realizewellbeing.com. And again, I'll link it up in the show notes. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview with Years Miris. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Here's welcome back to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad I could convince you to come back on. Oh, thanks for having me again. Yes. So this is an area that wellness professionals spend so much time, or HR professionals, we love to survey some people and we're going to walk yes. through. Yes, we do. Um, the seven steps like process that you go by in a minute, but uh, let's go ahead and tell us about the mistakes that people make when they are creating surveys. I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make is not necessarily having a goal for their survey. And what I mean by that is that we often feel, especially you know, if you're running sessions and you might, you might have this too, that, you know, you do sessions with people and then you might have a survey, right. And, Mm -hmm. and just to kind of get feedback from it. But, you know, a lot of times we're doing surveys because we feel we have to do a survey or that's just what we always do. Think annual surveys every year we do a survey, right. And there's no necessarily kind of uh, a thought process that has gone into, okay, what are we really trying to accomplish with this? Not just now, but maybe in the future, right? And, and you know, having that very clear goal or set of goals for surveys, I think then can help you determine what the content is, can help you convince people to take the survey and so on and so on. And I think, you know, that's kind of the, the real starting point is, is what do you want to accomplish with that survey? And then kind of moving from there to build out, you know, this is what the survey looks like. And this is how I'm going to get people to actually fill this in. So is it possible to have too many goals? Uh, Because maybe this isn't necessarily goal oriented, but one thing I've seen when people do surveys is they keep adding one more question and one more question and say, we're going to survey them anyway. And they just start tacking on extra questions. So that may be a separate question altogether. Um, But are there too many goals to a survey that that could be, is that possible? Yeah, I think that's possible. I think you want to make sure that, you know, just tacking on, okay, I'm going to add this question or add this question or add this question. It's that, you know, it might not actually, uh, or it might actually stand in the way from what your main goal is, right? Just adding certain questions may make people less likely to uh, complete the survey, which obviously is not good then to 
maybe fulfill some of your, your primary goals that you have. You know, if people seeing certain questions on the survey, it may lead them to respond differently to the questions you, you care about for your other goals, right? And so I think having these clearly defined goals of, of this is what we're really trying to accomplish can help that. And, and you know, you want to make sure that some of these peripheral goals you might have because you're serving people, serving people anyway, doesn't detract from kind of the, the main reason why you're doing it. So you should have one main goal, one primary goal. Is that fair to say? Yeah, or one or two primary goals. So I, I think you can have multiple goals, but you want to make sure that maybe some peripheral goals that you have doesn't detract from the primary reason you're doing the survey or the primary maybe two or three reasons you're doing the survey. Because putting you know an extra question on the survey or extra questions on the survey may uh, make people less likely to complete it. It may also, depending on the questions, change the answers that people give um, on the, the questions that are related to your primary goals. So I think thinking through what are the goals and then, and then what do I need to really fulfill those primary goals is kind of the key part. And then if you have some peripheral goals, you really need to think about how do, do the things I'm going to put on the survey for these peripheral goals m- detract or, or not detract from, from um, the items that are related to my primary goal? Okay. So I heard you, if I heard you correctly, you said one main goal, but you could really have up to three goals. I, I think you can. Yeah. I think once you get to, to three, more than three main goals, it can, it can start being a little t- bit too scattered. And you, and I think, the more the more of those you have, the more likely you are to detract from your main goal um, eventually, right? So you say you do um, a session, and uh, you want to maybe your primary goal is to evaluate that specific session, right? So that's your your primary goal number one. But then you can say, okay, my primary goal number two might be that. I'm changing some of the format, right? And so now I want, I don't just want to evaluate one session. I want to be able to look at past sessions and future sessions and see, does, do these changes or, or I'm experimenting around with formats. Do these experiments with formats have any effect on some of the outcomes I'm interested in? Then your third goal might be, I'm interested in kind of the, the very, um, proximate outcomes of that session, but I'm also interested in some distal outcomes, some outcomes over time, some outcomes after six months, right? And so all of those kinds of things will start factoring into exactly how you format the survey, how, what do you put on the survey and so on and so on. But again, as, as you can see, as I'm adding more goals, mm-hmm. the complexity of, of kind of getting it right increases. And so that's why I think you're, you're probably right that if you're, if you have three really primary goals, you probably don't want to add too much more to that. Mm-hmm. Well, just by nature of saying primary goals, there really should only be one, right? <laughs> yeah, but but you can have right. So so in my example, you, your your primary goal may be I want to evaluate this session, but because you're all also experimenting around with different formats of sessions, you know, another goal of yours. And I would say another primary goal is say, hey, does do these changes in formats really change how people feel about the session, right? And so, you know, we, we talk about primary and secondary in terms of uh, more in terms of levels, right? These are, these primary ones are the most important to me. And these secondary or peripheral goals might be some that would be nice to have. Get it. That makes sense. So, so your f- first step, actually, there's, there's two pieces to it. So determine the goal of the survey. And then you say the challenges, determine the challenges to maximizing utility. What do you mean by that? So I think in a very simple way, think of all the ways that your survey is going to fail to achieve that goal, right? And so if you kind of sit down and think, okay, I'm going to do the survey. I want to you know, evaluate this, or we just did a program for employees. I want to see whether the program affects you know employee well-being or maybe some work outcomes you know and then think about what are the challenges you could think of okay non-response what if 
not enough people respond to make some kind of inference about the program that I'm doing? What if, you know, the content in some way or some of the items I have, I think they're measuring this, but they're not really measuring that. Or people are filling it in, but they're going to just skip items because of how the item is worded. So there are some like higher level things, like what if people don't fill it in? Or what if uh, people get a negative experience of, from filling in the survey? And then some more detailed things also about, you know, am I actually measuring what I'm trying to measure in this survey? And so I think sitting down and kind of going through all the ways that this survey will fail to reach whatever goal I set or goals I set for it, um, we call the, these pre-mortems, is I think a, a really beneficial to then um, integrating those uh, solutions to those potential failures in your design. So do you know enough? So if you... I've been caught in the trap that I create my own surveys. So my questions make complete sense to me, right? So at this point, at the very beginning, do you get anyone else to look at it? Or is that really, and I know that you have a step pre-test and revise if necessary, but can you do it, get anyone to look at your questions ahead of time at this very first stage? Yeah, I think, I think, well, uh, at the first stage, no, that. because... It's more about the bigger picture, right? It's the goal. It's the pro. It's like kind of how you're getting the word out, right? Like it, getting people to take it. Yeah, I mean, so so the first step is mm-hmm. you don't do anything on the survey, right? So you don't make a survey. You don't have a word document with questions in it yet. Like this is just, I think, actually the most important step of before you even start going thinking about like why am I doing this. And even do you need to do a survey or do you, can you do something else to get data on whatever you're trying to get? Because companies have a lot of archival data as well. And there might be a way to, to make inferences about whatever you're interested in without actually having to do a survey, right? So that first step is really, you don't have anything yet. You're just trying to figure out why am I doing this? And if I'm going to do this, what are the challenges to it? Got it. As I was formulating that question, I was like, no, nah, that's not, I'm not even getting this right. Like, <laughs> you, like this is like really at the beginning, you don't do anything. So uh, I'm glad uh, that you clarified that. And I love what you said too, is like, do you even need to do a survey? Because I think that's a lot of our normal reactions. Like we survey people to death. Yeah. I think there's, there's this inclination to do a survey for a couple of reasons. One might be, we always do it. We do it after every session. Think of all the sessions you've been to (laughs) and then all the surveys you've had to fill in. Right. And so, you know, it's our natural indication to say, Oh, let's, let's, let's get data on that. Let's, but you know, as companies, especially if you're internal, as companies are getting more sophisticated with their data analytics, you know, they may have a lot of data now, not necessarily that systems are already set up to necessarily uh, merge data together and those kinds of things. So it might be a lot of work to get there, but you know, having objective data is always better than having subjective data, right? So if you ask someone, how many hours did you work this past week? That might not be the same as their objective hours worked, right? So I'd rather have their objective hours worked if I could get that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, another reason is that survey exhaustion. People get exhausted from filling in all the surveys. And so a lot of people, after a while, they just don't fill it in. And you can provide incentives and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, after a while, people just become less and less likely to participate, especially if they don't really see a, a point to it. Right. And that also goes into the goal is, you know, having a clearly defined goal means there is a point to it. There is an outcome to it. And if you can show people, look, whatever, if you participate in this, there's going to be an outcome to it. People are more likely to do so. Mm -hmm. Even if that outcome doesn't necessarily benefit them. Yeah. I think so. So we're kind of jumping ahead. (laughs) I don't mean to do that. We can, we can get into it. (laughs) And so the reason people fill in surveys is the same reasons that people speak up at work for any other reason, right? And the two kind of prerequisites are one, psychological safety. So are there negative consequences to you, you know, speaking up or filling in the survey, right? So if I, if I give you survey responses and then you're going to say, oh, yours said this or yours is not satisfied, right? And that's going to somehow negatively affect me, then I'm, 
obviously not going to participate in the survey or not going to give whatever information you're looking for. And the second is futility. So it's, if I do this, or if I speak up, if I give my opinion, is something going to change, right? So if I say, this is not good, is the person I'm saying that to actually going to take that information and try to do something about it? Mm -hmm. And same thing as with a survey is, if I'm filling this in, right, and there's no outcome, and then you give me another survey, you know, well, what's the point of me spending my time on it, right? Or, right. or, or doing anything. And a lot of times with incentives, what I've seen, and I've experienced this myself, is that if you give an incentive, but people don't see a point to it, what they'll do is they'll do just enough to get the incentive, right? Even just leaving questions blank and then just putting their email address to get the incentive, mm -hmm. right? Because they, they don't, there's no point to spending your time on it or they don't see a point to spending their time on it. So you would recommend not using incentives for surveys, I'm assuming from that comment. So what, what I've kind of grown to do, so I've done the range of, of incentivizing from nothing to paying everyone a set amount. And what I've found actually is the most effective is some kind of kind of raffle for uh, for something that's significant enough, right? So a so hundred dollar gift card and have enough of them, so it's not just one. So, but um, one thing the the reason is is that people kind of overweight small probabilities, right? So if you say, okay, you have a chance to win one of twenty hundred dollar gift cards, people actually think they're more likely to win that than they really are. Right. And so it's actually a really strong incentive if you don't necessarily have a huge budget. Right. The best way is just to pay everyone. But, you know, there are so many budget constraints. And, and you know, if you're external, you might not be able to just, you know, give out one hundred dollars or fifty dollars to everyone that you're trying to survey. But you could do some kind of raffle with the budget that you have. And, and that's basically as effective or close to as effective as almost paying everyone. Well, even if you paid anyone, so let me ask you this. So you just said that if you paid, if you give everyone an incentive, people would fill out the survey, but the data may not be as dependable. Like people are going to kind of half-ass it. My words, not yours. <laughs> so, well, 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 I think, I think it's that, that, that futility piece, right? Is that if there's no point to it, then that's what you're going to get with an incentive, right? People do fill it in if they see like that there's value to providing that information. And so if you're incentivizing and, they're, and, and, and you're not giving people kind of a, a point or a or, or reason to fill it in, then yes, that's, that's exactly what you're going to get. It's just, you know, I'm going to do exactly what I need to do to get, you know, whatever the incentive is. But if people feel, feel there's a reason, like there's a point to doing it and you're incentivizing them, even I think even then without the incentive, you can get a good sample size usually, right? So it depends sometimes on the population. There's a lot of factors that kind of go into that. But I think in general, if you give people a reason to fill it in, like a real reason where, you know, they know that there's, there's some point to doing it. I think people are willing to spend their time on it, especially if it's one of those like 10, 15 minutes. Obviously, if you're going much longer than that, then you know, there, there's other issues and complications that come with it. Right. So 10, 10 to 15 minutes is kind of the sweet spot time-wise? I what? think so. I, I think 10, 15 minutes, I think people are willing to, like less than 15 minutes, people are willing to spend their time on it. Um, I've done, you know, 20 minutes is, 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 you know, you can get people, but, you know, that starts becoming longer. Once you go past 20 minutes, I mean, one, you're going to have a lot of people who are, are going to start the survey and then just kind of trail off because this is starting to take too much time. Um, so I think 10, 15 minutes is probably the sweet spot. Um, it, it, you know, over 20 minutes, you really have to have, you know, a, a, a huge incentive for people to keep on going through that. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking through raffles and incentives, that made me think about, um, can, should you make your survey anonymous? Or should you ask people to put their names or does it just really depend on the situation and what you're asking? So I think, it, well, it depends on, it depends on the situation. It, it, it again, depends on the goal of the survey, right? 
the default, I think, should always be anonymous, uh, partly because it hits the psychological safety piece of it, right? If it's anonymous, there can't really be negative consequences unless you're asking some items that are that are pretty identifying and where I can figure out who you are. You know, but if it's anonymous, and most companies, I think, now do anonymous surveys pretty regularly, I think it hits that psychological safety component. The only reason that you wouldn't want to do them anonymous is if you are trying to connect that data to something else. And, and a lot of companies are weary for that because there's a lot of then issues with you know how a manager might identify an employee saying this. And so that would be the only reason you wouldn't want to make it anonymous. Now, I tend to encourage companies to kind of move that way. And we're, I usually serve as kind of the third party to do a lot of the linkages and those kinds of things because I have no say over employees, right? <laughs> to kind of facilitate that and provide new insights into whatever it is. I just recently worked with a company where we did a survey and we were able to take those survey responses and then connect it to the trove of archival data that the company already collects. And I think we were were able to provide some new insights that they didn't have before just by having some of those subjective measures attached to their company data. So that's the only reason I wouldn't make it anonymous. There's really no, no benefit really beyond that except uh, beyond, you know, just trying to link data to each other. So I'm, I'm grappling with this one for a minute. I'm thinking from a personal situation, because I find that I'll, sometimes the feedback is not very helpful if I get it anonymously. But if I get it, that I know the person who said it, then we can either have a conversation so I can understand it better, because I am very open to feedback. But I, I do realize that if there's not psychological safety there and there's not trust there, then they're not going to be you know, truthful, so, but is it, does it ever help to establish psychological safety? Cause you're like, no, I really want to hear how it went so I can improve. So, so let me ask you, do you have a continuing relationship with, with some of these people? Like, do, are, are these people that people that, you know, you're going to, you know, see again? Yes. It's a new, it's a new group of people I'm working on training in my academy and it is, um, yes, I will see them for the next six months. And that's the point of it is like, I am here for you and to make this a phenomenal, phenomenal experience, but I can only do that if I know what's working and what's not. Well, and then, and then I I think that's the challenge then is that, you know, say, you know, you ask for feedback in week two, right. Or week three, whichever one. And I tell you, well, the Academy, it's really not worth it. Um, You know, I, I'm not really getting out of it what I really thought. I, this wasn't necessarily worth it for me. You know, if I'm going to stay in that academy for it, that's going to, that might made, make it feel awkward between us, right? Because now I basically told you that whatever you're doing is not really what I signed up for. And now I have to kind of sit through it for, for a longer period of time. And you know, people might not give you that information just because now they have to kind of attach themselves to it, right? It's the same thing like we do in in, in at the university level. We do course evaluations, and there's and there's a lot of questions. Um, I mean, it's it's almost a masterclass on how not to do a survey, but you know, they are anonymous partly because there's this evaluation component, right? So I don't know if you're in your academy, you do any kind of evaluation or anything like that, but I can see where that can sometimes get awkward for some people and might dissuade them for, from not giving you that negative feedback necessarily. I guess, okay, I'm totally taking this on a personal level, level, sorry, audience, let me just ask this question. I guess if I had someone come up to me to say that, I would want to say, what's not working? How could we make it better? And if I can't make it better, here's your money back and you go on your merry way. Like, I don't like, but they don't know that I would say that, right? So I, I could see that from from what you just said. They may be like, well, I don't want to go tell her I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, well, and plus, I don't think there's no evaluation component, right? You don't necessarily have any control over their outcomes, I'm assuming. So so if, say, you were there, um, you know, you were internally within the, whichever company they work in, that might be a completely different dynamic, Right. If you're in their company, maybe you're at the manager level, you're providing workshops, you know, I'm not going to come up to you and say, hey, Jen, 
this was absolutely terrible. You really, you should change this and this and this. I'll probably just avoid giving you feedback, sit through the session and go along my day, Mm -hmm. right? And so I think that for psychological safety, there is this evaluation component, right? Is neg- there has to be negative consequences. I don't know if they're, if somebody coming up to you necessarily that there's negative consequences to them even giving you negative feedback, except just making it a little awkward. And, you know, that awkwardness in itself can dissuade some people from doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the one thing that I probably try to do is then make, make the survey anonymous and you could give people an option to say, Hey, if you want to, I'm really interested in your feedback and like improving this. If you want to um, have a conversation, you know, here's an option to write down your name, write down your email, you know, any way to, to kind of figure out who that is. So make it optional, right? So if you put it in the beginning, type your name here, people are going to feel, okay, I have to type my name here. But you might put it at the end, say, hey, I'm really interested in making this better. If you'd be open to talking to me about your, about your responses or about your feedback, you know, write your name here, write your contact information here. And that way, making it optional, you can get the people who want to give you more information or have that conversation. And people who don't really feel comfortable having that conversation can still you know, give you some of the information that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you um, for that really, really helped because now I have a thought in my head and that was very selfish. But um, (laughs) I think a lot of us are striving to prove our offerings. You know, I'm in a different situation, but for with employees too, you know, so that we're constantly asking them for feedback. And I think sometimes even from employees, like I'll do an employee survey and some of the stuff is just people complaining and you're like, this isn't really helpful. So I'm always just striving to make things better. But anyway, I'm going to get off talking about me and getting feedback. <laughs> and we're going to go to step two, because that took us on what I think was, was really helpful for, for the audience to talk about incentives and time frame. But um, going back to determining content, your, your second step. So what are some thoughts around content? Do you go to like standard, and I know the third one's format and wording. So I'm just going to shut up and say, what is behind determine content? So, so once you have your, your goal, right? So you're, you're, you know, these are the one or two things I'm really trying to accomplish. These are maybe some of the outcomes that I, that I want to achieve with, uh, with the survey. This, what am I going to put on the survey? And that's not necessarily getting into the details of items and those kinds of things, but, you know, what do I ask? Do I ask, you know, some demographics? Do I ask, um, you know, kind of whatever it is, kind of job satisfaction. Um, do I ask, you know, maybe I ask for satisfaction with the, um, the session. Maybe I ask for specific components that I'm really int- interested in. So this is like at a very broad level, like to achieve my goal, what do I need information on? Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's not even necessarily because you have the third step. So it's not necessarily getting into the, the actual questions. It was, so is the third step to ser- decide on format and wording of items. I'm imagining that's when we get into some actual, like, let's write some questions. Yeah, I think, I think say, say you're really interested in you know, something as simple as job satisfaction, right? How, and so the term and content would be, I need to measure job satisfaction to achieve my goal or one of my goals. And then the the third step would really be, okay, how do you measure job satisfaction? Now there's multiple ways, right? You can have one item, that one item can have multiple response categories, you can have multi-item measure and so on and so on. So that's kind of like how step two and three are paired with each other. And step two, you're just saying, okay, what do I really need to measure on the survey to, to achieve my goal? And then step three would be a lot more about, okay, now I have to make some choices about exactly how to measure this thing. And so when you're saying, how do I actually measure job satisfaction? Is it going, oh, are there existing other like validated surveys or is it, is it like I'm struggling with this one a little bit? Is it saying I, I'm going to actually use a Likert scale? <laughs> is it, so, okay. so yeah, so, so it, it can be depends. So there is a validated kind of scale for job satisfaction. I think it's uh, my memory is, serves me correctly. It's about 
six items, four items, something like that. But sometimes you might not, you know, be able to use uh, a scale like that or the, the, um, the other kind of sometimes challenge with using that scale is you might not be interested in general job satisfaction. You might be interested in very specific pieces of, you know, satisfaction with pay, satisfaction with your boss, satisfaction with, and, and, you know, the, the, like the, the validated scale for job satisfaction is really only, you know, just general, like, how do you feel about your job in general? But you might go for one item, for example, if your survey can't be very long or you have a lot of other things you need to put on there. Right. So if, yeah, so, so there, there is this balance of, okay, I can put six items for job satisfaction on there, but because it's six items, that's going to make my survey a lot longer for something that, you know, might not necessarily be as core as some other things that I need space for. And so you might just then just do one item. How satisfied are you with your job from, you know, strongly dissatisfied to strongly satisfied. So, you know, those are kind of at step three, some of the choices you're going to have to make, you know, think about open-ended, closed-ended. Do you want people to write responses out? Do you want to give them response categories? Do you have single items versus scales? Do you, thinking about the items that you have, are they under, how are they interpreted by your population, right? Giving the same items to, say a group of truck drivers is different than giving the same items to a group of doctors, right? They're going to think about those items possibly in a very different way. Order of questions, right? So where do you put questions? Do you put your, say some demographic information up front or do you put it in the back? Then there's some formatting questions. So do you use online survey versus paper and pencil, right? And some and that can also then determine the wording. So there's, a, I, I think in that step three, you're going through kind of all these details um, and they're all tied together, right? So if I choose an online survey, the, the way I structure questions or, um, you know, maybe how many items I use might be different than whether I'm using pe- paper or pencil. Mm-hmm. So speaking of wording, I think one of the conversations we were having when we even when I got the idea in my head for you to, to come talk about this yeah. is how we can maybe have leading questions or the way we word things is pretty important. So are there any tips for us to look out for as we're, we're writing questions so we don't lead people into the answer we're, we're trying to get? So I think you can lead people through uh, what you're putting in the item. For example, if you're kind of suggesting of, you know, we really want you to answer this, or we want you to answer this, or, you know, that's something to be careful about. But I think that's less common actually than questions where people are asking two things at once, for example, right? So how satisfied are you with your pay and benefits, right? I've seen that on survey. Well, I can be really satisfied with my pay and hate my benefits or the other way around, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so that's kind of a common pitfall. Another thing is like assuming that people understand what you're talking, what you're asking about. So I've seen surveys where a company's asking about, you know, changes in their 401k, right? And people don't necessarily know what just changed in their 401k. Um, even though you sent out a couple of emails about it, right? And so making, I, I think what's important is not making assumptions when you're writing your answers. And then I think also pre-testing kind of goes into all of those pitfalls. Maybe you're leading people, but maybe you're asking multiple things. Maybe you're assuming some things. Maybe people just don't understand what you're asking about in general, right? And so I think that pre-testing step kind of goes into that. And it's, you know, even though the way I, I structured it in the in the slide I sent to you is is kind of as this linear process. It is this circular process from determining the content to pre-testing, right? Is that you kind of then need to pre-test and say, okay, this isn't working for us, or we're getting something that seems off in some way or form. So with pre-testing, what you have is, is step five is is it you are asking for feedback from the actual survey takers or you're actually looking at the data and seeing if it makes sense what you get back or both? It, it's really both. So um, there's some, there's some uh, people that like to do uh, focus groups with their surveys, right? So you have maybe 
you take 10 employees from the population or 10 people from the population that you are going to ask to fill in your survey, you have them fill it in. And then um, on top of that, they do a focus group group to kind of talk through the survey and try to figure out, you know, what made sense, what didn't make sense to, to you know, for, kind of foresee anything that, you know, people that are similar to them are also likely to think about the items you have. And the other is the data. And that gets a little bit more technical. You would look at kind of what's my distribution on this. Um, one of the things you you would look out for is say if you have a, a middle category that says, say, for example, neither agree nor disagree, you would look at you know kind of the the, the frequency of responses on that versus on others. And then just the distribution. Are you get are you getting a distribution of the data, or is all data in a sense kind of focused on one column or one value? You would look at if you have a scale. You would look at uh, what's called internal consistency. So how consistent are all the items being answered within the same scale? So there is this kind of more data analytics component to that pretest, but then there's also more of a qualitative of you know, what do people think about the items? Are we making any assumptions? Are we asking items in a weird way where people are just getting confused? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because like I said at the beginning, when I was still in step one, formulating questions before I was supposed to. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you ask, they like it's, it makes a total sense in your brain. And then people are like, uh, what the hell are you talking about, Jen? I don't understand. <laughs> so Yeah, and that, I think... I think that's the thing. It's like we all we're all human, right? And so we all bring our own kind of frame of reference mm-hmm. when we're making questions. But then when you give it to the people that you know are actually go- you actually want information from that might you know that their frame of reference is going to be different, and so they're going to they might think differently about those things. And this is especially important if you're if you say you're internal or or external and you're doing it with multiple different populations, right? And so, you know, if you're in a company and you're surveying your engineers and then you're surveying another group of of employees, like uh, the, their frame of reference and the way they think about things is going to be completely different. And so, you know, make if you're going to take the same items, making sure that, you know, uh, you get input from all those groups is really important just to make sure that you don't need to make alterations to your survey, depending on the population you're going for. All right. So your sixth step is to ob- obtain buy-in from necessary people. I'm guessing that is the like kind of getting, um, getting support to make sure it's successful. Is that correct? Or Yeah. And so, yeah. so I think there's the, 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 the top layer of support and the bottom layer of support, right? So top layer of support is you want people who you know kind of are, are, are at the top of the organization to see that the survey is useful, right? Because there, I'm sure there's people who have you know gone out, done a survey, and everything where you know the upper level management didn't really feel like it was a worthwhile pursuit, and so that can then be challenging in terms of of, of maybe fulfilling some of the goals you have set for for whatever your survey is. So say your one of the goals of your survey is then to tie it to some of the other company data, that's going to start involving other people who need to have buy-in and that upper management needs to have buy-in to say, okay, this is something that we see as, as, as something that's worthwhile and important. And then you also want buy-in from the people that are actually going to take the survey, right? And that comes back to the point where I said, people have to see that there's a point to doing this. And if they don't see that there's a point, then why would I waste my time on it? Especially if you're asking people to kind of take their own time and invest it in in the survey you have. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nothing's more irritated than that. That Just keep asking me to do the survey. And I finally, I stopped doing that with my clients. I was like, there's certain things I can't fix here. I don't have the the power. Powers that be just aren't going to do it. So I'm going to quit asking them that question or I'm going to quit surveying about this specific topic or I'm going to take a year off because... I need more time to make some impact before I survey them again. Yeah, and I think I, in general, what I've always done is, you know, is say we're, we're we're doing a survey, we'll do a weekly reminder, maybe for three weeks, right? So we send out the survey, and then one week one, week two, 
And then week three, we basically say, hey, this is going to be it. This is the date. If you haven't filled it in, you haven't filled it in. And what you kind of see if you look at response rates is that, you know, initially you'll get big response rate, you know, people will, will respond and that will start tapering off slowly in the first week, but people will still respond. First reminder, it will go up a little bit and then it will kind of taper down to almost nobody really filling it in. Third response, it will go up just a little bit. It will go back to almost nobody filling it up for the rest of the week. And then the last one, you'll get like the, the stragglers, right? And by that time, um, you can kind of, if you look at the, the, the response, like even per day, you can tell that you've kind of gotten everyone at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, kind of, and we do it once per week, um, which seems to be pretty effective as kind of getting people to, uh, to fill it in who want to fill it in. But at a certain point, you know, you're just not going to get anyone else. And I think also more frequently, it just starts getting annoying. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, right. If, yeah. if I would be sending every two, every two days, like fill in the survey, I think it, people would be turned off that might otherwise have, have maybe taken a time to fill it at week three. Mm-hmm. Right. It's just like, okay, I, I'll, I'll just do it since, you know, I was going to do it anyway. Right. Um, so, the, so survey, so this is on the seventh step, the implementation. So week one, send out a, a, an email or communication. Week two, send out a communication. And week three is kind of the last last chance. So you, do you recommend three total or is there any... So well, that's one question. And then my second question is, do you recommend any pre-communications before the survey is even out to tell them it's coming? Yeah. So so in terms of, of the times, it's in, in general what I've kind of gravitated towards, I think, is is the initial and then one, two, three, right? Okay. Every so so it comes out on a Monday and then the three Mondays following there's a reminder and that that third Monday would basically then be the hey we're gonna close it. Usually I'll I'll give them another like five days till maybe till fr- till that Friday for anyone else to fill it in. But you know after that third reminder the the there's really just an uptick usually right after that day and then it almost goes down to zero because, and that's how you kind of know you've gotten everyone. Any other reminder is going to be minimal, have minimal mm-hmm. effect. In terms of like pre, yeah, we you definitely want to, if it's something you care about and that's what, and it kind of goes to back to the, the original point we talked about in terms of, do you really need to survey, right? Mm-hmm. So if you kind of take that approach and we're only going to survey you if it's actually if there's actually a point to it, we're not just going to give you a million random surveys because if you're an employee at a at a any or organization and you know me working at the university, I definitely tell you this from experience. You get surveys all the time, <laughs> but if if you as an employee know that they're only going to survey me, or, or even if it's just a once a year, and there's an actual like point to this, there's an impact that comes along with that then, you know, I'm, I'm more likely to fill it in. I'm more likely to, to kind of feel engaged with it. And so you want a lot of the, uh, we, I usually have uh, pre-communication from someone in upper level management, which you know, tends to be CEO, COO, uh, somebody owner, depending on kind of the, the structure of the company. And then I also try to get someone who has a good relationship with whatever population it is, right? And so sometimes in an organization or usually in an organization, there's like someone who used to be, you know, maybe at the lower levels and they really work their way up, right? Mm -hmm. But they, or somebody that engages with, say, say a group of employees all the time and they know who that person is. And having that person has actually been the most valuable thing to, to getting a good implementation. Because people trust that person, and if they say if if that person says, "Look, this is not a waste of your time," people are going to take their word for it, right? And so, having those two things, like you have upper level input and and support, and showing that support, but also having someone that they actually trust, and and if they say, you know, this is a worthwhile pursuit, then then we're going to take their word for it. I think can also be really valuable. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really smart. I mean, relationships matter, right? And if someone's telling me, and that's like a lot of it is if someone's telling me or suggesting to me that I trust that I should take it, then of course I'm more likely to take it than a random email. So, yeah, I mean, and we do, we do, depending on the, the kind of the situation we're going in, especially if we're positioning ourselves as kind of the third party there we're linking i do a lot of data linking so where i use archival data but then i'll 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 do a survey as well we do some communication as well um just so you know they know that there a, a lot of the behind the scenes that's going on with data is done by somebody outside of the company or somebody who actually has no say over their outcomes so in that in those cases I'll do some communication as well, either, you know, in an email or something like that to make sure that um, whoever I'm serving also understands that, look, even though there is some level of identification to this, this is kind of going externally to me and I'm going to be the one doing this. Mm -hmm. Wow. You have given us so much. I mean, I'm looking, I'm looking at my two pages of notes right now. Um, but is there anything we missed? Is there anything I didn't ask you or anything that you want to point out to my listeners about a survey that maybe you didn't cover? I mean, I know um, you teach it over a couple classes. <laughs> We're trying to consolidate it, but. Yeah, so this is, so, I mean, I think surveys in a sense are part a science and part art, you know, so the, the science part, I think you can, Every, everyone can learn and there's I'm sure there's good courses on just creating a survey there's there's you know my guess is if you go on the internet you can find some some good resources to do that I think there is this kind of experience with bad surveys that eventually gets you better at it because even now I I still have times where you know I'll catch myself and say okay that was probably not the best way to to work that I mean, it gets more about the details at that point, and so I think you know, just have you know, being you know, putting a lot of thought in your survey and kind of what can make it fail, and you know, what am I trying to achieve with this is uh, probably the most crucial part, and something that you'll get better in over time in kind of defining those things. And then those things will help you in the, the more technical component of it is, you know, how do I word items? Do I put a middle category in uh, my Likert scale or not? And those kinds of things. So, so putting a lot of time in that step one, as you get experience, you'll figure out that that's really uh, useful to eventually achieving the outcome. And the other thing that I would probably note is that you know, one of the things as as data analytics has advanced in some way is to think about like what else can I do with the survey that can improve my outcomes. So a lot of times you might think, okay, I'm just going to do a survey, evaluate the session, and that's all I'm trying to do. But you know, it, doing those surveys provides you with an ability to experiment with what you're doing. And then to track that data over time and say, okay, some what is working, what is not um, in a way that act- where you can actually say that, right? And so I think there's, you know, th- when you're going through that first step and thinking about the goals, I think thinking a little bit broader about than just, you know, I can take these ratings and average them, right? And kind of moving what we call a, the people analytics curve of sophistication, and kind of moving up that, I think is a, a big opportunity that I see a lot of companies, organizations not taking yet. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I mean, this is, this is really something that is, is so fascinating to me. Like I said at the beginning, it's something we do so often and you've got my wheels turning on how I can make my surveys better. And uh, I just appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And I think, I, I think uh, you know, kind of in closing what what to remember is that surveys are kind of one part of the package right so even in the class this is surveys make up a part of two of the i think about 14 sessions and and there's so much potential with data that i think is is being untapped and is only just becoming more sophisticated and more uh used and so thinking about broader like how does my surveying fit into 
you know, this potential of, of using data to improve whatever I'm interested in, right? Whether it's wellness programs, whether it's you're doing sessions, you're, you know, uh, surveys fit into the, like the broader approach that you're doing to towards improvement. And, um, and so I think that's thinking about whatever survey you're doing in that broad way can help you um, get a lot more value out of it. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate your time. Oh, right, actually, you're welcome. hold on. Wait, I didn't even ask you. I said, <laughs> <laughs> how can people find out more about you? Do you want them to contact you? Do you want to be left alone? <laughs> <laughs> so, I go into hibernation for teaching. Um, no, so so people can free, feel free to reach out to me via email is usually the best. So if you if you Google my name, you'll find my faculty web page with my email on there. And people are more than welcome to to ask questions. I can say already that the the class is it's an in class course for Wisconsin undergraduates and MBAs. So this is not something that uh, that is taught online or is available online at least as of yet. Yeah, it um, should be. But yeah, but b- besides that, well, you know that that that's another that's another conversation. Um, <laughs> but uh, but people can feel free to reach out to me with any questions they have about anything you know we've talked about or or, or data analytics in general. Good deal. I will link up the faculty page in the show notes so people can find you. And finally, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time. All right, really you're welcome. It. One of the things I frequently hear from wellness professionals is that they want a tribe. They want to find their people. In other words, a place where they can express their opinion without getting chastised for it and where they can get support when they're butting up against the old wellness paradigm. If you're looking for that safe space, come and join us in the Redesigning Wellness community on Facebook. To find us, you can just go to Facebook and in the search bar, type Redesigning Wellness community and it'll pop right up. You'll just have to answer a couple questions and I'll let you right in. I'd love to see you there.